So I am going to continue on Anapanasati Sutta uh, with a few sidetracks into other areas which concern meditation. Uh, the last uh, talk I almost ended uh, on the fourth stage of Anapanasati where uh, you third stage you feel the full breath from beginning to end and then you allow the, the breath to calm down. The calming of things like the breath is important. That is part of the meaning of samatha, calming things down in order to come to stillness so things can vanish and disappear. And uh, the calming of the breath also uh, fulfills another important factor of meditation which is increasing the awareness, the mindfulness and uh, arise, arousing piti sukha. To understand why piti sukha comes at this time and how it arises and that you do not need to, to will or to deliberately develop Piti Sukha, but rather let it arise by itself. The understanding of this comes from a particular way of uh, regarding the human mind, the jitta. Uh, you may say this is adapted from the suttas. It is uh, mentioned in passing, but not really clearly. I notice that the mind, the jitta, has two main parts to it. And those two parts of the mind are the part which receives information, which can hear my speech, which can see uh, what you're looking at, and which can be aware of your thoughts. It is a passive part of the mind which in English I called the knower, as opposed to that part of the mind which reacts to what it experiences, which gives things a name, which decides what to do, which thinks and reacts. I call that a doer. So with those two types of mind, or two parts of the mind, the knower and the doer, if you understand what I mean, it becomes very clear why most people are not mindful or their mindfulness is very weak because most of the energy which you have in the mind is used up by doing things. I always feel a bit sorry for those who are organizing this re retreat, people like Venerable Metta Vihari, who's sacrificing a lot of his mental energy making sure everything is uh, performed properly. And because you use up much of your mental energy, you will get tired. Because most of that mental energy goes in doing stuff. However, in this practice of meditation, we are stopping all of the reacting, thinking, planning, remembering, all of that which uses up the energy, that part which I call the doer, is restricted in its use of energy. Which means that there's more energy available for that which knows, the knower, for mindfulness. You will find that the more you do, the more you, th you think, the more you worry and plan, the less energy is available for mindfulness. So when you don't do so much, 
when you are just coming on this retreat in Bandarawela where you have no duties to your Dayakas, you have no duties to your Hamdro, you don't have to do anything, plan anything, you will find that you are saving so much mental energy. And if you go further not to think so much and worry so much, then you'll find you'll have extra energy available for sati, for mindfulness. You are pumping energy into your mindfulness. And as we meditate on something like the breath, it is such a simple thing to do that our energy increases in our mindfulness. It is like you are uh, energized, powered up, so that your mindfulness gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Just like if you have a torch, a flashlight, and the batteries are run down, you can hardly see where you are going. But, if your batteries are new and very, very strong, then you can see everything in the forest when you're walking through that forest. That is like the mind with low energy, with low mindfulness. It cannot see very much at all. It cannot know very clearly what's happening. But as the energy increases in the mindfulness, you wake up more and more, you can hear much more clearly, you can see much more, you can feel much more, you know much more. And as uh, my fellow monastic Ajahn Bamali, who comes here pointed out to me, that you can find a reference to this in the Anguttara and Nikaya in the eights in uh, the 30th Sutta, which is the eight thoughts of the great man Sutta. Because there one of the thoughts or one of the consequences of uh, those thoughts is that even your simple arms food tastes more delicious. Your little hut is perceived like a great mansion. Everything is enhanced in its delight and happiness as the energy increases in your mind. Which is one of the reasons why the fifth and sixth stages of meditation are where piti sukha arises with the breathing. This is natural, it is a sign that your mindfulness is increasing in power, in energy, and you're experiencing that increase in energy with a greater degree of happiness. It is just like when maybe you were a lay person and when you first woke up in the morning you were so miserable until you had your first cup of coffee. All the coffee does is give you a free boost of energy or cup of tea, free energy. I call that vitamin C, vitamin coffee <laughs> and vitamin tea, <laughs> Sri Lankan tea. Those are the two vitamins which I take because I'm getting old. <laughs> I don't take multivits, I only take vitamin C and vitamin T. <laughs> and that gives you a boost of energy and happiness as well. But that is unnatural. The natural boost of happiness and energy comes from stopping doing things and allowing the mental energy to go into knowing. Again, you wake up. And examples of that, that I think the first time I started noticing this was on a rains retreat uh, in northeast Thailand. And during the rainy season retreat, the monsoon season, it was very difficult to do Changama walking meditation in, in the forest. So we'd always try and use the, the Dhamma hall, the, the meditation hall. And, like many simple monasteries, the meditation hall just had a concrete floor with no tiles or carpet or anything, just a plain concrete floor 
which had been laid by the villagers. And you know that villagers have wonderful hearts, but sometimes very lacking in skills. So that concrete floor was very bumpy. <laughs> when they smoothed it, they never used water, they just spat on it and then tried to level it. <laughs> but it was the best they could do. And there I was walking meditation backwards and forwards while it was pouring with rain outside with my gaze one and a half meters in front of me not thinking, not worrying about the past or future, being in the present moment, just being aware of the feelings in my feet as I lifted them and moved them forward and dropped them to the ground. And as I was walking very, very peacefully, I had to stop. I could not walk anymore because what I was seeing in front of me, that piece of concrete, became one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. There were many different shades of grey and maybe it was because the villagers were not so skilled in laying concrete. It was not smooth and in those uh, different uh, contours which you saw on the, the, uh, the heights and the valleys of that concrete it looks some, something like an amazing sculpture and the different greys, dark greys, light greys of the concrete stood out like some amazing painting. The sort of uh, art I was used to seeing in the National Galleries of London. It was beautiful, it was wonderful, it took my attention and so I was just staring at it, enjoying it. It was delightful to watch. Just an ordinary piece of concrete became one of the most beautiful sights I've ever seen. And I stood there, must have been for 15 or 20 minutes before I could walk on again. I thought that was weird, strange. How could a piece of concrete look so beautiful? But there was an even, this has happened to me many, many times. The story which I tell, which is quite gross, but which I love saying because it's one you will never ever forget. <laughs> What's the time? You know what's coming, don't you? <laughs> one of my favorite stories, that I was teaching a meditation retreat in my retreat center opposite Bodhinyana Monastery in Western Australia. And when I'm teaching a retreat, I'm also enjoying the opportunity to meditate quietly. And I do get some very wonderful meditations. And this was a time, very deep meditation, came out with a huge smile on my face, with lots of piti sukha remaining from the meditation. And the only reason I got up was because I had to go to the toilet. And I went to the toilet and sat down and I made a mistake, please don't do this if you've just had a good meditation. I looked at the content of the toilet bowl before flushing it. And as I looked into the bowl, wow! I never in my life had I seen such a beautiful piece of shit. <laughs> now, you may think that it's something disgusting. But there's so many different shades of brown, dark browns, very dark browns and less dark browns. And the way those colors were arranged together was like it was painted by some maestro. And also the way that the balls were stuck together, it was like it was some sculpture, like a rodan, but something much more deep than that. And it appeared so beautiful, I was looking and staring at it going, wow, that's amazing, that's so incredible, that's beautiful. And then what took me was the aroma which was floating up. It was earthy, it was deep, it was natural. And it was such a wonderful, wonderful smell which filled all my nostrils like, a, like a, a, an aroma explosion. <laughs> and I... <laughs> I was standing there staring at the contents of the toilet bowl 
wow, this is so beautiful and so fragrant. This is amazing. This is wonderful. And I will confess in my stupidity that I did actually think, the thought crossed my mind, should I take this out and show one of my friends? <laughs> but I resisted doing that. And I tell people it was only because I've been training all my monastic life in letting go that I could actually press the little button <laughs> and abandon and let go of the most beautiful piece of feces I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> now, that <laughs> that's a gross example, but it actually serves the purpose of showing that when the mind is very strong and powerful, even something which is usually regarded as dirty, repugnant and filthy looks incredibly beautiful and even fragrant. So, how about the breath? When the mind becomes strong in mindfulness and you have a lot of mental energy, the breath does appear very, very delightful and beautiful. It's natural and it's a sign that your mindfulness is strong. If your breath has yet to appear delightful and beautiful, it's simply because you've been doing too much, thinking too much, striving too hard, and that your, and that your uh, energy is low. Doing too much and starving energy from mindfulness. The more mindful you get, the happier you become. That's the natural law. And it's one of the reasons why when anybody, lay or monastic, comes to interviews and talks about their meditation, I've had some lay people come in and tell me, I've just emerged from second jhana and I don't listen to what they say, I look at their face. And if they are not smiling from ear to ear, overcome with joy, I tell them, no, that could not have been a jhana. If you have deep meditation, it gives you so much happiness and joy, so much pity sukha. It is the afterglow of samadhi. So, this is the reason why that after a deep meditation, the Buddha said, even your food tastes more delicious than ever before. Even your simple alms food is like a banquet at the President's palace. And even your simple hut appears like a mansion. Even your patched robes appear like something which has come from the boutiques of Paris. Everything looks gorgeous and beautiful. Because that beauty is not in the object, it is not in the food, it is not in the, the simple hut, it is not in your robes, it is not in the breath. That beauty, that delight is what's added by a mind which is very, very happy and powerful. So, it is why the stages of Breathing in, breathing out, experiencing pity, breathing in, breathing out, experience sukha. The fifth and sixth stages of the Anapanasati is a sign that your mindfulness is increasing in strength. And it also serves the purpose that you do not need to put any effort at all into continuing your awareness of the breath. When something is that delightful, you cannot take your awareness away from the breath. Even if you are called to go to an appointment, the mind does not want to go. Yes, people say that's attachment, but as you, if you've heard me talk before, if you look in the Pasadika Sutta of the Dīgha Nikāya, the Buddha said, that if members of other sects complain that you monks are just attached to the bliss of meditation, you should answer correctly, yes, we are attached to the blisses of the meditation. 
And if the members of other sects say, well, what are the consequences of being attached to the pleasures of meditation? You should answer, there's only four consequences, four results of being attached to the bliss of meditation. And that is, so one, once returning, non-returning, or arahatapala, which is what we are supposed to be achieving. So, if you indulge, get attached to the bliss of meditation, that is what you can expect. In other words, it's a good thing to do. It's what we're supposed to be doing. So what happens by being attached to that bliss of meditation? It comes, you cultivate it, you develop it, you care for it, preserve it, and so you are meditating, having a joyful time. Which means that you meditate more and more and more and more. The mind wants to meditate. It enjoys meditation. And being a monk in Sri Lanka, what else can you enjoy? You can't watch movies, you can't listen to music, you can't have a girlfriend, nuns can't have boyfriends, you can't have any of the usual fo uh, sources of happiness and joy, but you can have something even greater, the joy of meditation. That is the happiness of a monastic. So, when it happens, enjoy. Don't think that something is going wrong and try to get rid of it. And any monks, any teachers who say that do not enjoy meditation, you get attached to it, you should see how silly that is, how stupid that is, and how much against the teachings of the Buddha that was. So, enjoy the meditation. Have fun with it. Which means that when you get into the stages of fifth and sixth stage of Anapanasati, that means that you will meditate a lot because you enjoy it. To lay people, I say that meditation is not going to the dentist. Meditation is going to your, your favorite holiday resort. And it's one of the reasons why, whenever or wherever I teach meditation, here teaching meditation in Bandarawela, this is not the Bandarawela tourist resort. It is close, but I rename it for these remaining days Club Med Bandarawela. <laughs> Club Med means, not Club Mediterranean, Club Meditation. Bandarawela, <laughs> Club Med. So that means people like coming here. They enjoy the meditation. And quite honestly, accurately, whenever I teach a meditation retreat in Australia, it is booked out within minutes. I think the last meditation retreat, which I haven't taught yet, will be over the Easter period in April. It books out in nine minutes. All bookings online. After nine minutes you can't get on. It's already a big waiting list. So it's popular. People love doing this because we teach that stage of meditation, get people at least to the fifth and sixth stages of Anapanasati, so they're enjoying meditating. And to me this was natural. When I was a lay person, I enjoyed meditating. I looked forward to it. You know, it's just sitting down, soon getting into the awareness of the breath, and then just enjoying the breath. And that was one of the reasons you could sit for a long period of time. It wasn't endurance, it was fun. It was joyful. And I did mention, I think yesterday, that even many of my lay supporters, when they come to meditate, they miss their lunch. And they are taking eight precepts. They know they're not going to eat again until the following morning. And they're upasikas, upasikas. You know, they're not used to fasting in the afternoon or evening. But nevertheless, 
it gets to now 10.30, 11 o'clock, and they're enjoying their meditation, just breathing in, oh, this is nice. Oh, breathing out, that's really nice. They enjoy it so much, they'd rather carry on meditating and go hungry in the afternoon. That gives a measure of how much happiness there is in this type of meditation. Now, one of uh, my monastic friends, uh, he's a Thai monk, and I, he's senior to me by a few years, but you know, he's a very good friend. I will usually go to see him quite often. Uh, it's a monk called Ajahn Ganha, and he is a great Thai monk. And this particular monk, just to give you a nice interesting story of what forest monks really should be able to do. He was sitting in the jungle somewhere in Thailand with some other monks one day, sitting there nice and peacefully, when a big snake came up. And everybody opened their eyes because it made a huge noise. And this was a king cobra came up to see all the monks. And in that part of northeast Thailand, they had a nickname for a king cobra. It was called in Laotian, the one-step snake. The one-step snake. When I asked, why do you give it that name, one-step snake, the villagers explained, because if that snake bites you, you've only got one step left, and then you die. <laughs> it's very venomous. So the one-step snake came up to this monk. It's raised its head right in front of Ajahn Ganaha's nose opened its hood like cobras do. <laughs> right in front of the monk's nose. <laughs> now you all know, or you should do if you're forest monks, that don't try and run. If you run, the snake will soon catch up with you. They are much faster than you are. Especially, especially if you're an old monk and fat like me. <laughs> no way could you outrun a king cobra. So what this monk did, tss, 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 this snake, right in front of his nose, all the other monks saw this, he raised his hand and patted the king cobra on the head, saying in Thai, Thank you for coming to visit me. And there the cobra was having his head patted. It's very rare, extremely uncommon, for a cobra to have his head patted. And he appreciated it so much, he just st stood there, not moving, enjoying every moment of having his head patted by a holy monk. What a great blessing that was. <laughs> and I, could you do that? <laughs> and after a few moments, the King Cobra put his head down and went to see one of the other monks. Raised his head, opened his, his hood to get another patting. And apparently the other monk said, no way, go back to Ajakana. I'm not going to do that. But that's the type of monk this Ajahn Ganha was. He has very deep meditation. And whenever he taught meditation, it was such a simple teaching, repeated the same thing over and over again. His, his, his teachings and meditation was just breathe in as peacefully, as joyfully, as happily as you can. It is a Thai word, which any one of you who've been to Thailand would have heard. It's called Sabai. It comes from the Pali word Sapaya, but it's totally different in meaning. It means nice and easy and comfortable and pleasant. Breathe in, Sabai. Breathe out, Sabai. He said that's his only meditation teachings.
nothing else. And it's pretty good teachings. It is going straight to focusing on stage five and six of the Anapanasati Sutta. Develop the beautiful, delightful experience with the breathing. That's why it is so important. And I, to my disciples over in uh, Australia and throughout the world, I call this the, the turning point of meditation. Because once you get to the delightful breath stage, everything else becomes so easy and natural. Where people fail in their meditation is not getting to stage five or six of Anapanasati. Once you get there, the rest is so easy to do. You can't resist it, it's just too delightful. So, whenever that comes up, please encourage the delightful breath. And when the delightful breath comes up, just please keep on meditating. You don't need to sort of stop or get up. And as far as I am concerned as a teacher, I tell my monks you can miss any appointment, you can miss anything which you have to do. If you're having a joyful meditation, just carry on. You don't have to come to the putty mug, you don't have to come to lunch. There's some dana which we have to go to, some ceremony. You just stay and meditate, because that's what we're really here for. And the same here, if you're having a delightful meditation, just carry on. Don't get up, don't come to the talk, don't come to anything. Carry on with your delightful meditation. Because that deepens and deepens and deepens. Because it is delightful, the mind focuses automatically. Whatever you find delightful, you don't need to focus on it. It actually pulls your attention towards it and holds it there. What sustains the attention is not you forcing the mind onto the object, it is the object drawing your mind your attention onto it. So you're developing the delightful breath. And it's because you don't need to do anything. You really can't do anything. You're having a wonderful time just watching your breath go in, breath go out, feeling I can do this forever. And it is like that, just breathing in and breathing out. It is so delightful you can't even feel the aches and pains in your body. In the same way, I have heard this and had it confirmed many times, that people say playing soccer can sometimes break their leg and they don't feel it because they're enjoying the game so much they cannot feel the extreme pain in their body. Or people, you now maybe your diakers, watching a movie on the TV. They're watching the movie, enjoying it so much, the feeling in their bladder saying, I must go to the toilet, I must go to the toilet. They can't feel that. They're just so engrossed in the movie. Or people in Sri Lanka watching the cricket, only a couple of overs to go, and their leg hurts, their back hurts, but they can't even feel that. They're just so engrossed in the last few overs of the cricket match. It's the happiness blocks out all the other feelings. So once you get to delightful breath, it's so easy to carry on with your meditation. You don't feel uncomfortable. Which also means that because you're doing less and less and less and less, there's more and more energy going into mindfulness. Your mindfulness increases and increases and increases. The happiness gets more and more and more. You really are enjoying the meditation. And because you're doing less and less and less, your body needs less and less oxygen. So you're breathing less and less and less. And the breath becomes really smooth and even. Just breathing in, breathing out, you can hardly tell the difference. And more importantly, you can't even tell the difference between the beginning of an in-breath and the end of an in-breath. I did say yesterday that I've never read the Visuddhi Magga, but I have just flipped through it and seen some very beautiful similes. And one of those is a simile of the carpenter who is sawing a piece of wood. 
the first of all, the carpenter who's focusing on sawing the piece of wood can see the end of the saw and the handle of the saw and the edge, the both ends of the piece of wood that he is sawing. But as he focuses in more and more just on where the saw is touching the wood, after a short time that carpenter can't even see the handle of the saw or the far end of the saw. He can't see the left end or the right end of the piece of wood. He's focusing just on a very tiny area where the saw blade is touching the wood. And as he's focusing in on that very small area, he does not know whether that little saw tooth, which is all he can see, is the end of the saw or the beginning of the saw. He just knows it's a saw tooth, that's all. And this is a simile of the Visuddhi Maga, which I totally concur with, agree with that when you get into such powerful mindfulness, you cannot know whether this is the beginning of an in-breath, one-third of the way through the in-breath, two-thirds of the way through the in-breath, no more than the person who is sawing a piece of wood knows whether that saw tooth is at the beginning end or somewhere in the middle of the saw blade. You're just focusing on a tiny area, so you don't know. And as anyone who has sawn a piece of wood knows, every tooth of the saw looks the same. And this is what it's like with breath meditation. Every part of the breath appears the same to your mind. Which means that nothing much is changing with the breath. The breath is smooth. Every moment of awareness appears to be the same. This is when it's calming down that uh, citta sankara. That's the, what's it called, the uh, seventh stage of the Anapanasati. No, sorry, that's the eighth stage of the Anapanasati. Where the whole breath calms down. And as it calms down, because nothing is moving, the perception of the breath vanishes. You do not need to be aware of your breathing throughout the whole of Anapanasati. The breath has a job to do. And by this stage the breath has performed its function and something else takes over. In the same way in the Samanyapala Sutta where King Ajata Satu was taken by his doctor Jivaka to see the Buddha at the Veluvana, the bamboo grove. He said he took the chariot as far as the chariot could take him. And then he got off the chariot and walked through the forest as far as he could in his sandals. And before he went into the hall where the Buddha sat, he had to take off his sandals. He could take the chariot as far as the chariot could go, walk in his sandals as far as he was allowed, and had to go the final step in bare feet. The same way with something like the breath, the breath can only take you so far. And the breath will then disappear, it's done its job. And when one gets to the ninth stage of the Anapanasati Sutta, that is experiencing the jitta, that is when the breath has vanished. It's not there anymore. Now many of you, or many meditators, get confused. Aren't we supposed to be watching the breath? No, the breath has done its job. Now in the ninth stage, you are still breathing in and breathing out, but that's not what you're focusing on. You're now focusing on what happens when the breath vanishes, which is usually the nimittas, the beautiful lights which appear in the mind. At this stage, you're not aware of the breath, you're just aware of this beautiful light. It does happen sometimes that people get to the stage where the breath vanishes and they see nothing at all. One of the reasons for this is because they allow the breath to disappear and they haven't got strong enough mindfulness to know what is there when the breath has vanished. The simile, if you're in a kuti in the jungle at night time when there's no moon out, 
inside your kuti it's light, you walk outside it's dark, which means at first you can't see anything in the darkness. But you just wait for one or two minutes and then the pupils in your eyes, they get bigger and wider allowing more light to come in and you start to see shapes. When you walk from a lit kuti out into the forest, at first you can't see very much, be patient, wait, and soon you'll be able to see. So if that happens to you, that you are got a delightful breath, and then it sort of vanishes, and you can see nothing at all, no lights have happened yet, stay where you are, be patient, because soon you'll be able to see some lights just like when you step out from a lit room into the darkness. It's just what happens. But there was a little error in the meditation which was you did not uh, develop enough piti sukha, which is a sign you didn't develop strong enough mindfulness with your breath. That was a bit of a mistake, an error in your meditation. Which is why I try to encourage people more and more that when delight comes up, feel it, focus on it, develop it, don't be afraid of it. Because if you develop that happiness in meditation, especially the develop, develop the happiness with the breath, that will strengthen your mindfulness, which means that you will see those lights much more easily. Secondly, because I am an upajaya, I have very proud of my sadhiviharikas, those who I have ordained, and there's three of them here on this retreat, which I'm very proud of. They're my, they're my, my children, like my babies, <laughs> the ones I've ordained. <laughs> and I'm always so very interested to see how they're going on. So thank you for coming to, to let me know that you're still prospering and alive, and also the other friends I've been with in my monastic life. So, uh, whenever I ordain anybody, there's a little gata which, as a precept at Upajaya, uh, it is the custom to chant. And that is that Sila Paribhavito Samadhi Mahapalo Hodi Mahani Sangso. That when your meditation, your samadhi, is supported by Sila, it's of great power and of great benefit. And sometimes people wonder, what is the purpose of precepts, sila, to meditation? And this is a statement by the Buddha, it does empower the meditation. And in particular, you experience the benefits of sila, of keeping your precepts, and not just patimoka sangwara sila, but indriya sangwara sila, the restraint of the senses as well as restraint according to the Patimoka rules. This is one of the first times you see its clear benefits. Because if you have a very good strong sealer, those lights come up very early and very powerfully. It is the sealer, your precepts, which make you a very pure, happy, powerful mind. For example, there was one of my students in Malaysia who managed to go through the delightful breath and calming the breath down until it disappeared. And he got his nimitta coming up. But his nimitta, he said, it was like a dirty rag, stained and blotched. So immediately I asked him, because he thought it was a mistake in the process of meditation. He wanted some meditation trick to make it brighter and cleaner. But then I said straight away, how are your precepts? What have you been doing the past few days? And at that his face went red and his head, he couldn't keep eye contact with me. He was very ashamed, he'd been breaking his precepts for the last week. I said, those precepts affect your jitter, affect your mind. If you've done something really wrong, argued with somebody, been disrespectful or even broken a precept, 
When your nimitta comes up, you see that straight away. Your mind isn't bright and pure and powerful. You can see this really clearly. You can't sort of deny it. If you are a good monk, a good nun, keeping your duties, keeping your precepts. Yes, you can hide the precepts from other people, hard breaking the precepts from other people, but you can't hide it from your jitter. On the opposite side, if you really are a good, kind, virtuous person, that when your nimitta comes up, you see it as bright and beautiful. And like some people say, as soon as the light is absolutely gorgeous, like a sun, pure and powerful, that is a sign of your precepts. So the precepts are an important support for your meditation, especially at this stage, the ninth stage of the Anapanasati Sutta, when you experience the jitta, the mind, which is seen as a, a, a light, that is where you see the benefits of sila. How it empowers the meditation. Sila, paribhavito, samadhi, mahapalohoti, mahanisangso. So there you have a beautiful light in the mind. The happiness gets stronger. And sometimes those lights get so powerful that people get scared. This is one of those times when fear comes up to meditators, the first time they see a beautiful light because it is powerful. All it really means is they cannot control it. Anything which is more powerful than you, that you are normally scared of. In the jungles, you may be scared of tigers. Are there any tigers in the jungles of Sri Lanka still? There are still, has any of you seen a tiger? I've seen a tiger. Once I was only about, well, maybe about three foot away from the tiger. Huge tiger staring at me and I was staring at the tiger. It's only about three or four foot away. And I must confess to you, I wasn't afraid at all. Not any fear at all in me. When I was looking at the tiger, eye to eyeballing the tiger. And only about four or five feet away, not scared at all. Was that really impressive? <laughs> it wasn't impressive at all because it was in a zoo. And, and there were big iron bars <laughs> between me and that tiger. It wasn't in the jungle, it was in a zoo. <laughs> It was only about four feet away, we were eyeing each other, but big bars, so I felt very safe. <laughs> and, so again, when you give barter, you can get serious, but every now and again, do something funny, then people smile, and get a bit of happiness, they pay more attention, it's not boring anymore. <laughs> so, but this is more powerful than a tiger. Actually, there's a nice tiger story, uh, mention a tiger. Uh, this was told to me by one of the monks in Thailand a long time ago about fear and how we never know whether we're going to be afraid or not unless you have very powerful meditation. Because one of these Thai monks, he was like walking, charika, going all over the Thailand, staying in the jungles. And in Thailand, in the jungles there, the such monks were always expected to get to the village now, in the mid-afternoon, to tell the head man of the village that they have arrived, so the head man can show them a suitable place to stay the night in the jungle, and also so the villagers could prepare food for Bindabhata the following morning. So when this monk came to the village, the head monk said, I think it would be better for you to meditate and stay the night in the village with us. And the reason is there's a tiger who's killed many of our water buffalo and even killed one of our children and eaten them. And it's in the village, it's close by in the forest. 
So because of that, it's better for you, monk, to stay in the village where you feel safe. But the monk said, no, I am a forest monk. I am giving my life for the Dhamma. I am not afraid of tigers. I'm going to meditate where the tiger is and face down the tiger with my power of samadhi. That sounded like a very tough bhikkhu, like an Arnie Schwarzenegger in monastic robes, if you know Arnie Schwarzenegger. <laughs> so the headman took this monk to where the tiger path crossed one of the main paths to the next village. And he could see the tiger path through the jungle. And the monk said, great, this is where I'll put up my mosquito net for the night. This is where I'll stay, right on the tiger path. So the headman left him there and went home before it got dark. And I did mention to you that one of the very common ways of meditating in Thailand is to do the breath meditation and to chant the mantra Buddho, Buddho, together with the breathing. So there this monk was sitting there. It was dark, he was very peaceful, watching his breath going Buddho, Buddho, with his breath, getting very peaceful. And then he heard a sound of some animal coming along the path. Buddha, Buddha, as his breathing got faster. And as <laughs> the sound got closer and louder, Buddha, 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 Buddha. And then he opened his eyes. And he saw the huge tiger in front of him, maybe five or six feet away. And instead of chanting Buddha, 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 he started chanting tiger, 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 tiger. <laughs> and that's where he lost his mindfulness. He said he didn't know how he got under the net of the, of the uh, mosquito net. But the next thing he knew, he was running away from the tiger. You no, know, doing his chant, not just silently, but now speaking it. Tiger, 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 tiger. Now it is against our, not really precepts, but against our custom that monks should not run. And there's a good reason why monks should not run. These robes we wear do not have buttons and zips. So if you try running in these robes, they tend to slip off. And that's what happened to this monk. First his outer robe slipped off, and then close to the village, his under robe also slipped off. And when he got to the village, running for his life, shouting, Tiger, 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 Tiger! All the villagers looked through the, they were woken up, looked through their windows, came out their doors, and what did they see? A monk with no robes on at all. <laughs> totally naked. <laughs> and that was a monk who wasn't afraid of tigers. <laughs> so, you never know what you're going to be afraid of. But, <laughs> don't run. <laughs> He became a very famous monk in that neighborhood, <laughs> but for the wrong reason. So, because he was proud, he thought he was stronger than the tiger. <laughs> but, if you, uh, uh, if you keep your precepts and are restrained, are in a good monk, the when a limiter comes up, it's very pure and beautiful, which makes it easier to watch. However, there are some tricks for you. Because I've been doing this meditation for such a long time that I am like a lawyer who knows all the loopholes. 
knows how to get around obstacles rather than being defeated by such obstacles. Monks, nuns are human beings and sometimes we get angry because we're not enlightened yet and say the wrong things and sometimes because of stupidity or proud, pride we will break our precepts. As long as you don't break the big ones for goodness sake. And then you're always forgiven but it does leave a stain on your jitter. So if that happens to you and a and nimitta comes up but it's a bit stained or dirty the loophole is whenever you see that dirty rag of your nimitta, the light in the mind the stains aren't all over, there's a few little places which are clean and pure and what one does is one focuses the mind on the pure part, the clean part you zoom in on it you don't zoom in on the faults, the dirty part. You zoom in on the clean part, the pure part. And as you zoom in on the most beautiful part, it's as if like that beautiful part just gets really big and you can't see the stains. And you zoom in on the most beautiful part of the beautiful part. You zoom in on the most beautiful part of the beautiful part of the beautiful part. Always zooming in on the pure part. And that's the way your nimitta just becomes very pure and very bright and very wonderful. To do that you have to have a very positive forgiving mind. However, there are some people who have a very fault-finding mind. And they develop that. Now, I'm trying to do my best, but you can always find fault in what I say, what I do. It, people even found fault in the Buddha. And if you can find kind if you can find fault in the Buddha, <laughs> the most purest, wonderful being which ever lived in, in our uh, Buddha period, then surely you can find fault in anybody, you know, sort of including myself. But that is a wrong way of looking at the world with a fault-finding mind. Instead of putting the fault, put the fault-finding mind away and having a mind of gratitude which appreciates all the good things you know, which your fellow monastics are doing. Yes, they're not pure, perfect, but they have so many wonderful qualities. Focus on the beautiful qualities. And if you can focus on the beautiful qualities of your fellows in monastic life, your sisters in monastic life, and appreciate those, and just forgive and put aside any faults or any bad speech they've made. Just forgive that, let go, and instead focus on the beautiful qualities of your fellows and sisters in monastic life. Then you have this beautiful loving kindness and friendship and happy abiding together. If you find fault with each other, you can't stay with anybody and your life as a monk becomes quite miserable. And it's also you're developing the wrong quality. If you develop fault finding, then eventually when a nimitta comes up, you'll always go to the faults and errors in the nimitta, the smudges, the stains. But if you develop a mind of gratitude, a mind which looks at the beauty and the goodness in your fellow monks and nuns and disregards their faults, then when a nimitta comes up, you'll automatically go to the most beautiful part of the nimitta and it'll become very bright and beautiful. It's one of the reasons why Developing a fault-finding mind creates so much suffering for yourself and others and hinders your passage into the beautiful nimittas and eventually jhana. So even on this retreat, it's, it's not perfect. I'm sure there's many things wrong. Yeah, the monks, nuns, they do talk. Even last night there was a couple of dogs, please don't get rid of them, a couple of dogs outside my room one o'clock in the morning, woof, 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 woof! <laughs> well, I can't find fault with a dog. That's what dogs do. Dogs go woof, woof. <laughs> it's not their fault. <laughs> That's their nature. <laughs> so instead of finding fault with them, you just, ah, never mind dog. And then, because I don't find fault, they can go to sleep again very quickly. So please don't find fault with this retreat, with the managers, with the food, with me, with anybody. If you do, 
you are hindering your meditation. Instead, have this beautiful gratitude, this seeing the good in yourself, in this retreat, in others, and then when you get to Nimitas, you'll automatically go to the most beautiful part and the Nimitta will grow and become very strong and happy. But, the Nimitta talk, the main thing about Nimitas is much more to say that will come tomorrow morning. Today I just wanted to uh, talk about with a few stories intertwined to make you uh, interested. I talked about the stage 5, 6, 7 and 8 of the Anapanasati which is all about developing the perceptions of pity and sukha by doing less and allowing the mindfulness to increase stronger and stronger and stronger till it's powerful enough and happy enough to be able to perceive the nimitta. So there we are, that's a bana for this morning.